turn now to our scripture reading for the morning. At least this is the first of our scripture readings. I'm going to start here in Exodus 22, verses 1 to 6. And I'm not going to read the following three passages in order. We'll come to them as we go along. They'll be on the screen behind me. But also, if you'd like, you can flip along, of course, in your pew Bible to keep track as well. And so we'll start in Exodus 22, verses 1 to 6. We're tracking along with the work of God progressing in the covenants. Today, we're in our second sermon in the Mosaic Covenant. Last week, we saw that God saved the people of Israel out of His grace, out of Egypt. And now, we see that God establishes a law, a covenant, together with them, and this too is a covenant of grace. And so we'll read from Exodus 22, verses 1 to 6, but first we'll pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love Your Word. We know that it is by the power of Your Word that You change hearts and You change lives, that Your Word is effective to do whatsoever You desire for it to do. And so we do not know precisely what it is that you desire to do with your word today, but we are eager to see our own lives affected. We are eager to see the work of your word in our church, and we are eager to sit under it to know that what you speak is truth and to bring our lives in conformity with it. So we pray that you would bless our time, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Exodus 22, we'll read verses 1 to 6. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun has risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the stolen beast is found alive in his possession, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over, or lets his beast loose and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and in his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain or the field is consumed, he who started the fire shall make full restitution. Now, I suppose that I am stepping a little bit or sailing a little bit into some uncharted territory for most pulpits. Uh, we usually, uh, most pastors will preach a series through Jonah or through the letters of Paul. Not many will get into the weeds of Leviticus and Exodus. And I do not uh, mean to make myself some kind of hero because I'm dipping in for one week and then we're moving along after that. But this is an important portion of the Word, even though it's hard for us really to get into. There is a reason that we dip into it and then come right out of it, and that is because there is a huge difference between the world that we inhabit and the world of ancient Israel. At least we perceived there to be a huge difference between those two worlds. Sometimes we, we speak about a cultural barrier. It, it seems when you look into the book of Leviticus as though perhaps there are three cultural barriers between us and the ancient world. And so it can be difficult really for us to grasp the significance of what we're reading here. But as we read this, we need to look for Christ. We need to see in the law the work of Christ. And we need to see in the law how it is that we can be drawn near to Christ. All of Scripture leads us to Christ. I've said it before. I'm sure you've heard me say it before. There's a saying in England that all roads lead to London, and so it is with the Scriptures. All Scripture leads to Christ. Some just gets there faster than others. And so today, we'll put the hard work into the books of Exodus and Leviticus to see as they draw us to Christ. And as we do, we will see one big overarching theme, and that is that God is God of all. And that's what we see is one commentator said, all life is to be held within the setting of spiritual and religious devotion. Or the same commentator says, perhaps more simply later, true religion cannot be confined. That God is God of all. 
And he's God of all of our lives, and that's what we'll see here in this passage today. He's God of all of our lives, whether it be our lives within culture, whether it be our lives in our homes, whether it be our lives in whatever, whatever sphere, whatever realm we may find ourselves, God is God. There can be no hidden reservation of sin in our lives. There can be no dark corner where we sort of keep God out of it and say, hey, you can have this part of me, but this, this little part, this, this this is mine. There can be no dark closets where sin lords over us. God must be God of all of our lives. Again, whatever realm, whatever sphere we live in, God must be God of it. We must submit ourselves in all things to His sovereignty and to His glorious holiness. Remember now where we are in the Bible, though. We're coming out out of the time of the salvation of God out of Egypt. We've passed through the, the ten plagues upon Egypt. We've crossed with Israel through the dry ground of the Red Sea and then seen the soldiers, the army of Pharaoh, swamped in that sea. We, we come into this passage and God is addressing a newly birthed free nation. We see that this law that God gives comes after grace. That's always the pattern that God uses. There is first grace and then there is law. We saw that that was true with Adam and Eve. That first God made them, first God formed them, then He had a relationship with them, and after that, then He gave them the law, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. And the same was true of Noah, that God had grace upon Noah. And then it was true of Abraham. Abraham does not come to God, but God comes to pagan Abraham. And after he comes to him, then he gives him the command. After he gives him blessing, then he gives him the command to go. So now we come to Moses as well. First there is salvation out of Egypt. Now there is law. And the law is given to structure the life of Israel. In this way, the, the law is of grace. And so as strange as it is, again, the law is gracious. Now this is only, this is only part of the law. Of course, you go through the whole back half of Exodus and the, most of Leviticus and Numbers, and then Deuteronomy, you have the law again. Much of it a repetition of what the Lord has already said in Exodus and Leviticus, and all of these laws are meant to promote justice and to promote peace. And so that's what we find in the Ten Commandments. Imagine, imagine a world, imagine a church in which the Ten Commandments are entirely disregarded. It would be chaos. It would be a community that nobody particularly wanted to be a part of unless, I guess, you were the biggest and the strongest and you could take advantage of everybody else at your own discretion. But God gives the law to create order, to promote peace, to promote justice. And in this case, in these six verses, God is giving a sort of exegesis. He's expanding upon the Eighth Commandment not to steal. So Moses is making application of this principle, do not steal. And we see in this that there are two requirements. There are kind of two parts of the Eighth Commandment. The Westminster Shorter Catechism and, and Larger Catechism, they do a very good job of this. They take the commandments and they note that in the Scriptures they are applied positively and they are applied negatively. That is, that the commandments tell us what we should do and they tell us what we should not do. And they are more principles than they are just limited sentences. You read, you shall not steal. That very, it seems very simple, but really it's more than that. We are to desire, this is what the Westminster Shorter Catechism says that the Eighth Commandment requires of us. It requires of us to desire the lawful furthering of the wealth and outward estate of ourselves and others. That is that the Eighth Commandment requires us to love our neighbor, to want for our neighbor to prosper. And then it has a, forbid, a forbiddance for us as well. Again, the Shorter Catechism, the Eighth Commandment forbids whatsoever does or may unjustly hinder our own or our neighbor's wealth and outward estate. So we are to love our neighbor, 
and desire their good, and we are not to hate them by doing whatever it may be done that hinders them from gaining wealth or gaining security or being provided for. And that's what we see here in this passage. You come into this very first verse, and we see that someone is addressed who has stolen an ox. Now an ox, that may seem like it's not that big of a deal to us, but an ox was a huge deal in ancient Israel because an ox was like a tractor. An ox was worth more than just its, its meat. In fact, its meat was not really all that significant. An ox could pl- pull a plow and bring prosperity and fruitfulness to the land. An ox could tread out the grain and make it much easier to get the food out away from the chaff. An ox was like a farm implement. And so if you stole a man's ox, you stole the machinery by which he could provide for himself. If you stole a man's ox, you hated him because you were willing to put the well-being of his family at risk so that you could benefit from whatever it is that belonged to him, from his ox. And so you put his family at risk in order to benefit yourself. So the penalty of this hatred is very steep. Five oxen for one ox. It's a heavy price to pay. It's very merciful compared to neighboring countries. The Babylonians required if you stole an ox, you would have to pay back 30 oxen. And if you couldn't do it, you'd be put to death. And odds are, if you're stealing an ox, you probably can't afford the 30. And so here we see five, five oxen. If you are caught stealing, that's the price. And as you see down in verse 3, if debts can't be paid then a person is sold until they're able to pay them. And by sold, we don't simply mean sold into slavery, we mean sold into service. That a person was required then to go and work for somebody else until he had made enough money that he could pay off the debt that he owed. And so, here it is that in the Eighth Commandment, the application to the stealing of an ox, a man is required to pay. But then another law is given there in verse 2. If a man breaks into a house, how do we respond to the breaking in of a house, to a robbery? I just learned recently that there's a difference between burglarizing and robbing. If a burglar goes into a house when there's nobody present, a robber goes into a house when there are people present. And so this deals not with burglary, this deals with robbery because it deals with situations in which there is somebody home. And so Moses says, God says, if somebody breaks into your house in the evening when you are home, you may kill them without being guilty of that man's blood. And the reason for that is you do not know why they are there. If somebody breaks into your home in the night, you don't know if they have a knife. You don't know why they are there. You do not know if they're there to attack you or merely to steal your possessions. And so in order to defend yourself and to defend your home and your family, if you strike down the man and he dies, you're not guilty of any sort of blood guilt, manslaughter, or anything like that. But on the flip side, if he does it during the day, and it is apparent that he has only done it for the purpose of stealing, not for the purpose of harming, you may not kill him. Because killing a man for stealing is not just. Killing a man for stealing a man's life is worth more than another man's possessions. And so if you come into a house to steal, and the man strikes you down, even though you had no intent to harm him physically, then you have been wronged. It's been said in Israel, even the thief, had his rights. God is being just. And so then in verses 5 and 6, we see then punishments for unintentional destruction. What happens if a man starts a fire over here, and all of a sudden the wind blows and the fire spreads over here to another man's field, and all that he has is burned up? What's the consequence? Well, the consequence is we might say that he's supposed to pay penny for penny. But there's no interest. You see, with the stealing of an ox, you had to pay five oxen for the one ox. And later on, and and we'll see later that you have to pay a 20% interest on things that you have stolen intentionally. But here it was accidental. 
And so whatever it is that you destroyed, you pay for, but nothing more because you did not mean harm. You see that there are different levels of punishment because there are different levels of wrongdoing. Some is intentional, some is not. And so the Lord deals with all of these things appropriately. What's the, what's the big point here in these, just these first six verses? The big point is that the Lord is God of community. The Lord is God of society. Big public things like stealing, God is God of these things. Our interactions, our public interactions with other people, these fall under the sovereignty of God as well. And if God is God of society in verses 1 to 6, then He is God of all manner of things as we move forward into verses 16 to 27. We'll just read verses 16 to 20 first. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. It really seems like kind of a hodgepodge. What What do these things have in common? What does does fornication have to do with uh, sorcery? And what does that have to do with uh, bestiality? And if you go on farther down into the, into the passage, what does that have to do with caring for the sojourners and the widows and the orphans? It just seems as though these are a hodgepodge of laws. And in, in a sense, they are. And what's the big point? It doesn't matter what it is. God is God of it. It doesn't matter what it is that you do wrong. You offend God whether you commit fornication or whether you are a sorcerer. All things are to be submitted once more to God. And we see this with verses 16, 17, and 19. These are rather strange to us. I suppose the one about lying with an animal isn't so strange. We would understand very easily that that's wrong, just as we would understand that homosexual acts are wrong because it goes against the way that God made things to be. God made there to be a nature, and this is unnatural, and so it's easy for us really to understand why this is the way it is. But why does a person who seduces, and by seduction, we don't mean anything malicious here. This is, this is not a malicious, forced seduction. This is a man who seduces a woman by attracting her to himself, and she willingly is attractive. This is, this is, a, an, this is a situation of mutual attraction, we might say. And what, is this, what does this have to do with God? Well, we, we think very lowly of this kind of thing. At least I think many of us do. Because we live in a hypersexualized world, where we think very little of uh, sexual immorality of any kind. Uh, for example, the things that most of us would watch and tolerate on our television screens would make our great-grandparents barf. Because they would see what it is that we are observing, what we let our eyes see, even if we don't think it's that bad. And they would say, how can you look at that? We are so desensitized to sexuality that even this kind of passage in verses 16 and 17 seems strange to us. Why Why would a man who does this be forced to marry the young girl? Well, first of all, we think of it flippantly, but God never thinks of sexuality flippantly. God always thinks of it seriously because He made it to be the pinnacle of human relationship. And there is always, there is always a connection, no matter how much our, our society may try to drive it apart, there is always a connection in sex between sex and marriage. This is why Jesus can say later, many, many, many years later, when He comes to the Samaritan woman at the well, and she tries to dodge His questions, and He says, you have had five husbands And the man you have now is not your husband. And he says to her, in effect, every man that you have slept with is, in a sense, your husband. And the man you are with now is not actually your husband. God never thinks flippantly of this. But more, even more in view than that here, is the protection of the woman. 
the protection of the woman who was seduced. A, wo- a woman who was discovered to have lost her virginity would have become a significantly less attractive candidate for marriage. And so the man here has harmed her significantly because in those days a woman depended upon her father and then her husband for protection and for provision. And so if a woman was harmed or if a woman was, was rendered to be an unattractive candidate for marriage, then she may very well be reduced to poverty and if things went worse, even to prostitution. And so God says to the man, you did what was wrong, now you're going to pay the price. You need to put your life where your body is. Why? Because she deserves to have protection. She deserves to be provided for, and your action cannot be permitted to have minimal consequence for you and maximum consequence for her. And so the Lord is protecting her. And so there is justice, there is grace involved here. And then we see as well that God is a God of worship. Verses 18 and 20 show this, that there are sorcerers and there are idolaters and both are to be put to death. And this sorcery, this idolatry, should bring our minds, coming out of Egypt, should bring our minds back to Egypt. Because who is it that Moses and Aaron did battle with? But they did battle with the sorcerers and the magicians. And those are the kinds of men who are enemies of God. They cannot be tolerated in Israel. And the same is true with idolatry. Now this seems like a rather harsh consequence. Doesn't it? If anybody commits idolatry, they should be put to death. We might be familiar enough with the Bible to know that is the case. But why is that the case? And it is simply because the people of God cannot be permitted to live in perpetual temptation to idolatry. And we see the awful, terrible consequences of this later on when you come into the book of Joshua and Judges. The Israelites fail to destroy all idolatry and idolaters out of the promised land. And what do those people do to the people of Israel again and again and again? The people of Israel are seduced by their idols into committing idolatry, and it eventually destroys them. So God says there can be no room for idolatry. There can be no room for sorcery. There can be no room for magic. Now this doesn't have a one-to-one correlation between ancient Israel and our modern secular state. We can't can't go about in America saying we should execute every idolater because that's not a connection. But there is a connection between this and our church and the church at large. The church cannot tolerate idolatry cannot be tolerated. Wherever idolatry is found in the church, it needs to be addressed, it needs to be rooted out, and it needs to be destroyed. And so wherever we find idolatry, idolatry must be destroyed, and the idolater must be addressed and called to repentance. And then if they will not, then they must be removed from the church. Excommunication, removed from the church, is the New Testament version of execution, being removed from life. Because when a person is cut off from the church, they are cut off from life. Now praise God, in His mercy, the person who is cut off from the church may, in time, realize their guilt and come back in repentance. But there can be no room for idolatry in here. So God is God who requires the right object of worship. And then we turn to a very strange passage in Leviticus 10, verses 1 to 3, where we see that God as well is God of the manner of our worship. God is the right object. God has the right to decide what manner our worship takes as well. Leviticus 10, verses 1 to 3. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, <clears throat> excuse me, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. 
Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Aaron, the first high priest, his sons, kind of the assistants to the high priest, we might say, and two of these four sons, they come and they offer unauthorized fire. Now, what is unauthorized fire? I don't know what unauthorized fire is. All I know is that God had told his people how he was to be worshipped, and the sons of Aaron did it a different way. They were flippant, or they were careless, or probably at worst, they were just trying to to impress themselves, or perhaps impress others with their righteousness, and going maybe above and beyond what God had instructed them to do. And because God is not worshipped rightly, He is displeased, and they are destroyed. Now what do we see about this? We see again that God is God of the who of our worship, and the how of our worship. God cares what we do in here. This is why we regulate what we do in here by the Word of God. If we don't see God being worshipped in a way in here, then He should not be worshipped in a way in here. We do not do different things just to be innovative. If you go to a church ever that has innovative worship, you, you should get out. Because Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, had innovative worship, and that did not go very well. We should have the simple things in the worship service, the preaching of the Word, the prayer, the giving of thanks, the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, the things that we see in the New Testament. We see the things that Paul instructed Timothy and Titus to have his churches do. We ought not to have other things because we risk the very thing that Nadab and Abihu offended God with. So again, God is God of the who and the how of our worship. Then, flipping back to Exodus 22, we see there that God has more laws for the governing of the people. Verses 21 to 27. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them, and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. In what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear him, for I am compassionate. Now what do all these commands have in common? All these commands have in common caring for those who are vulnerable, those who are downtrodden. And the sojourner here, the sojourner, this is not just somebody who's traveling through. Someone who sojourns is someone who lives in a land that is not really their own. So we can think of a person living in the land of Israel, but who is not an Israelite. We might say he is something like a legal resident. He's not a citizen. And as such, he would not have been treated, uh, treated as an Israelite by the Israelites, and they may have been inclined to mistreat the sojourner. But God says, remember, remember that when you were in Egypt, you were one of them. And you were mistreated. And so do not do the same to others as was done to you. And the widow and the orphan likewise would have been at a disadvantage. And the one who was poor would have been at a disadvantage. And so a man, if he had nothing else to give as security for some kind of loan, would take his cloak. That would be kind of the warm article of clothing he had. And he would give it as a pledge, sort of as a a security deposit. But if the man has given his security deposit as a cloak, how does he stay warm in the dry, cold, Middle Eastern night? But he's miserable. So the Lord says, you can take it during the day as an example that yes, Things need to be made right, but you may not keep it overnight lest you make your brother suffer. And then he has extra words for the poor as well. You may not lend money to him for interest. 
Now, there are these wretched stores called cash checking or cash advance stores. They are predatory. If you drive through a community and you see them, it is, it is a, a, a degradation of the community to see those because they take, they take money, they give you an advance, and then when you finally have money, they take an exorbitant amount. And what happens? You stay perpetually impoverished because you don't have enough money, and then you get less money than you have, and so you need to go to them, you need to go to them again. And so they keep you in this perpetual, this perpetual state of poverty, and in this, they profit off of you all the while. And the Lord says, you may not do that. You may not do things that intentionally keep my people poor to your own benefit. So God cares for the poor. He cares for those who are sojourners, for those who are widows, and those who are orphans. And why is this? He says why at the very end. He says, for I am compassionate. If God's justice is reflected in verses 1 to 6, God's compassion is reflected in these passages. Why do we care for others? Because God does. And the punishment that God gives for those who will not care for the poor, for the orphan, is that their wives will become widows and their children will become fatherless. In other words, I will do to you what I did to the Egyptians. What happened to the Egyptians because they had been nasty? What happened to the Egyptians because they had been murderous? What happened to the Egyptians because they had enslaved people? Their husbands, their fathers were swamped in the Red Sea and the sons became fatherless orphans and the wives became husbandless widows. And I will do the same to you if you do the same as they did. This ought to be a warning for us it ought to be a warning for us to have generous hearts. The Israelites received a great salvation. But have we not received a greater salvation? And if they were commanded to be generous based on how God had been generous with them, how much more should we expect and be required to be generous and be eager to be generous in our own day? God has given to us, and He expects us to be kind to those who have less. And so we see again, as we track through this, God is a God of law and order. God is a God of our sexuality and our family. He is God of our worship. He is God of our hearts and of our compassion. And then finally, as we come into Leviticus 5, God is God of our holiness and restoration and of grace. So this will again be the last passage that I'll read from the law, Leviticus 5, verses 14 to 6, 7. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram without blemish out of the flock, valued in silver shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for a guilt offering. He shall also make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy thing, and shall add a fifth to it, and give it to the priest, and the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. If anyone sins, doing any of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not know it, then realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him for the mistake that he made unintentionally and he shall be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He has indeed incurred guilt before the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, If anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery, or if he has oppressed his neighbor, or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, in any of the things that people do and sin thereby, if he has sinned and realizes his guilt and restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or the lost thing that he found or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it 
and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. And he shall bring to the priest as his compensation to the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any of the things that one may do and thereby become guilty. Uh, two things here, I want to breeze through them onto one main point. The first is that here the Lord deals with the matter of unintentional sin. Perhaps someone is lax, perhaps they just miss something on accident, and then they realize it, and they are still guilty. We are guilty of sins that we do not know our sins when we commit them. But there, the Lord offers a means of forgiveness, a means to make it right. When you realize that you are guilty before the Lord, you come with a ram, you add, uh, you add 20% to it, and you present it to the priest, and then he makes the sacrifice. And what do we read? Two times in both, both, both verses 16 and 18. And he shall be forgiven. And then you go forward, and the second matter is of theft. But this theft is different than the theft from Exodus 22. In Exodus 22, that thief was caught. In Leviticus 6, this thief confesses. And when he comes and confesses his sin, he must do three things. He must restore to the person he stole from what he took. Then he must restore it with 20% interest. And then he must make a sacrifice to the Lord. See, he has sinned against two persons. The one he stole from and the Lord whom he offended. And so he has to go make it right. But then what do we read once more? He shall be forgiven. What do we see here? All over, this, all over this law, we see God's mercy, we see God's love, and we see God's grace. We see God's mercy and His love and in grace in providing for the person who was stolen from, in protecting the one who was, had their home broken into, in compensating farmers for their crops. We see God's mercy in providing for the woman who was taken advantage of. We see His love for His people and not allowing them to be led into temptation again and again and again in idolatry. We see His mercy and His love for the poor and for the forgiveness of careless sins and the forgiveness of intentional and confessed sins. But do you notice something? You will never find a prison in Israel. There are no prisons in Israel. You don't pay your debt to society by sitting in a prison cell for 25 years. In Israel, there is a principle. You will make it right, and then you will be restored. And if you can't make it right, if what you've done is so heinous that it cannot be made right, then you will be executed. But if you can make it right, you will make it right, and then you will be restored. That's the principle. That's, that's the pattern here. You did right. Then you may, then you, you, sorry, you did wrong, you make it right, you forgive, and you move on. That is a good pattern for parenting. If I may make an aside, this is a good pattern for parenting. When you observe a child's sin, you confront them with their sin. That's merciful to not allow them to continue living in their sin. You confront them with your sin. They confess their sin. And then you have them make it as right as they possibly can. And then what do you do? You forgive them and you restore them. Parents, grandparents, whoever, do not hold sin over your child's head for hours and days and months and years, making them feel shamed because they sin. Give them the dignity of making it right and being restored. Do not put your child in some sort of social-emotional jail, but allow them to be freed from their sin and guilt the same way that God allowed His people to be freed from their sin and their guilt. That ought really to be the way that we operate as a church as well. That as a church, and perhaps particularly in church discipline, we observe sin. And we acknowledge it. We ask it to be brought forward and to be made right as best it can. And then we restore and we forgive. Christians do not major in shame. 
Christians major in grace. Shame lingers over the head like a storm cloud. You ever seen the the show Winnie the Pooh? If you haven't, I'm sorry. If you have, then great. All around Eeyore, this, this forlorn donkey, is a cloud, and it's always raining over Eeyore. Shame is like that. Shame is just lingering over us. It prevents us from being free and having joy. We are not stealers of joy. We are givers of the message of joy. We provide forgiveness, not shame. Grace, not guilt. Who wants to have theirs? Do you want God to hold your guilt over your head for your entire life? Or do you want God to give you the grace to carry it far, far away? Give me the grace. And so we also as a church need to be those who give grace. Grace is everywhere in this passage. God gave grace to Israel. He could have left Israel in slavery, but He didn't. He could have destroyed them at the base of Mount Sinai for their sin with the golden calf, but He didn't. He could have left them all on their own as a new nation with no laws and no structure to their society, but He didn't. He could have left the poor vulnerable, but He didn't. He could have left those who had sinned without any hope of forgiveness, but He didn't. He provided forgiveness. He provided the means for forgiveness. Now, a ram plus 20%, that may seem like a pretty steep cost, but what is a ram plus 20% compared to the value of your soul? It is like nothing. So God shows grace. And so perhaps the road from Exodus and Leviticus to Christ is not so long after all. Isaiah bridges the gap very famously in Isaiah 53. We'll read just verses 7 to 10. He says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. This he is Christ. And he is the offering for guilt. He is the one who is crushed, who bears our iniquities. Peter makes a direct connection between Jesus and The man of Isaiah 53, 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Forgiveness for the Israelite sinner was a ram plus a fifth. And if you sinned again, a ram plus a fifth. And if you sinned again, a ram plus a fifth. And again, and again, and again. But not so for us. Because a ram plus a fifth can only go so far. But the blood of the Son of God goes on forever. And so the blood of Christ is not only sufficient for one or two or three or ten, but for ten thousand and ten thousand ten thousand sins. So that we need not coming back again and again and again for another sacrifice, but we rest in the one. We have not just the greatest sacrifice which has ever been made, but the greatest sacrifice which could ever be made. If you ever want to see the glory and the grandeur of Jesus, the best place to look, I suppose, in my opinion, the best place to look, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, is the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews says again and again and again, Jesus is greater. And this is a good place to start here. Hebrews 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Yes, how much more? Infinitely more. And then he continues to go on in the next chapter, chapter 10, 
And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. For the Israelite, one sin, one ram, two sins, two rams. For the Christian, 10,000 sins, one Christ. Take heart, Christian, there is forgiveness in Christ. But take note, there ought to be forgiveness in you as well. And that lays behind all of this, doesn't it? That if you have been stolen from, and the man comes and confesses his sin and gives you what he stole, plus 20%, you have to forgive. You can't ask for more. That's it. It's made right. And that's how it is for us as well. We have been forgiven. We must also offer forgiveness. Isn't this what Jesus taught us to pray? Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtor. And he preaches on the mount, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You see, mercy and grace come this way, but they also have to go this way. And if we are to receive the grace and the mercy that come this way, then we have an obligation to offer it to others as well. And so we see in the law of Moses, that God is God of all, and He is a God of grace. Let us always remember and never forget both truths. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again confess that we have not had You as God of all of our lives, and we recommit ourselves to striving for that. And we know in advance that there will be areas in which we fail and we thank You that we do not need to come to a priest again and again and again to receive a new sacrifice again and again, but we have a great high priest who has been seated in the heavenly realms who always intercedes for us and who is enough to forgive. And so God, let us lay ourselves entirely at His feet and trust entirely in His blood for our salvation. And we pray in His glorious, matchless name. Amen.